Good morning. Good morning. My name is Billy Crane. I'm the pastor here at Christ Church Kerrville, and I'm sorry for our delayed start. Be that you would connect our uh, camera to the live stream so that those people who aren't able to be with us today, who would long and desire, who long and desire to be a part of our fellowship in this way, would be able to connect. Lord, they are your children, and that you love them, and uh, this has been a blessing for them. And we pray that you would do this, Lord, and uh, give. Uh, Ed and through in wisdom as they seek to navigate these problems in the midst of this time, Lord. We lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, welcome. It's up? All right. There we go. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, let's pray again. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you would answer the prayers of people, of your people, even someone like me. Uh, we pray that this would continue throughout the service, and we ask, we thank you that you are gracious and merciful and kind in the little things as well as in the big things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, today, uh, as we prepare, we're going to take a few minutes to prepare our hearts for worship. And I was looking at the call to worship this morning, and in the second um, paragraph it says, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. You know, one of the things I love about the Christian life is that Jesus doesn't say, Hey, everyone who's got everything together, everyone who's perfect, you may draw near to me. He says, if you're needy, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, I am for you. I am the place for you. Come draw near to me that I may fill you, that I may satisfy you. And I hope and pray that that is what happens this morning. That in your place of neediness, that you come and drink deeply of the greatness of our Lord and that he would meet and satisfy you here. And I ask that you would take just a few minutes. Uh, you may use uh, the bulletin, some of the words of preparation to prepare your heart to uh, 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 prepare you to worship the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, Amen. Uh, thank you. and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to the Lord and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God. Please bow your heads. Lord, we come to you today to taste and see that you are good. Thank you that blessed is the person who takes refuge in you. And we pray that we would be a people who find our refuge in you. We thank you that you welcome us into your presence, that you delight to satisfy our deepest needs. Praise you for your kindness and mercy. And we ask that you would bless our worship today and that it might be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's praise together.
resign us, so, uh, who doesn't want to stick us far away from, but he wants to embrace us and celebrate us. And, and that brings us, uh, puts in perspective this time of confession, that whatever you have to confess, it is, it is not too much for the Lord. He tells us over and over again, bring to me the heaviness of your heart, the failures of your life, and let me minister to you and forgive you. He can handle it. So I encourage you to go to him with the worst of you right now. That he might forgive you and cleanse you and embrace you just as you are. And remind you of his powerful love in Jesus Christ. I will lead and then you will respond. But when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am not worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son, for this my son was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and the three of us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Please take a moment to confess your sin silently to the Lord.
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of, dawn, of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is a delight to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Uh, today for our pastoral prayers, the first part of it is shaped by parts of Psalm 48. So uh, hopefully you'll hear hear some of that coming out. So with that, please bow your head as I lead us in some in the pastoral prayers. Lord, you say in your scriptures that great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Lord, how true this is. You are great and you are worthy of praise, worthy of our praise. When you are among us, you are a great fortress. When the kings of the earth oppose you, even if they were all to join together, they cannot stand before you. Like Pharaoh, they will be crushed as they flee in terror. Because we dwell with you, we will rest secure. Within this place, this humble house where we dwell, to where we are to worship you today, we pray that we would meditate on your unfailing love. Your name is great. Fill our hearts with praise as we see your goodness. May praise of you fill the earth. May Christ's church be glad and rejoice in you. May the city of Kerrville sing your praise. May the state of Texas bow before you. May the United States of America know that you are God and that you are good. May all the peoples of the world celebrate and rejoice in your glory. We thank you and praise you that the day will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. There is none like you who reigns in heaven yet dwells with men. We thank you and praise you. You are our God forever, and you will guide us to the very end. Father, we come to you today sensing our own weakness and frailty. 
We need you. We need a solid rock to stand on in this difficult and challenging time. Put an end to this coronavirus. Bring peace and clarity in the midst of social and political unrest. May we cling to you above all things. You are our Lord, and our hope is in you. Lord, you are our rock and our salvation. You are our fortress, and in you we will never be shaken. In the aftermath of this election, we pray you would remind our hearts that our trust is in no human leader, but is in you, our great King. May we trust in you with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. May we acknowledge you in all our ways and have confidence that you will make our path straight. Father, we lift up to you those in our community who have suffered the loss of a loved one, and we have had meaningful time with her in her final days. Father, comfort and strengthen Adam, Kirsten, and Adam's family as they continue to grieve Adam's father's unexpected death from COVID. This is such a painful, difficult, and heartbreaking loss. May they know you are near, and would you give them peace. Lord, we lift up Anne Huey and her family as they mourn the loss of our dear friend and brother Jerry. Draw near to them, and particularly her, and comfort her. We lift up Joan Wilton as she continues to mourn the loss of her husband, Herb. Comfort her and give her strength in the midst of sadness and uncertainty. Lord, we also lift up Jonathan Jones and his family as they mourn the loss of Wanda Jean, your precious daughter. Give them the freedom to grieve. Draw near to them through your word, spirit, and the love of your people. Lord, we lift up Halsey and Ray in the wake of the passing of Halsey's father. Comfort her in her loss and give her peace. Lord, we pray for those in our midst who are hurting and sick and in need. Father, we lift up Melody Justet. Bring peace to her body and give her the strength to endure. Heal Kathy Lester of the complications she is experiencing from her aneurysm procedure. Lay your hand of blessing upon Deborah as she deals with the effects of Parkinson's. We thank you that Cindy Holmes is finished with her cancer treatment. Please continue to heal and restore her body. Father, we also ask you to be with those who are suffering financially. Provide for them. Meet their needs in abundant and creative ways. Give them cause to praise you before the world. Lord, with all that is happening, we ask for your comfort. And we praise you that you are the God of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles. Bring us comfort that we may comfort those who are also in trouble. We pray now together these words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, welcome again to Christ Church. So glad that you're here in this most unusual of circumstances being down in the basement. Uh, I want to greet everyone who is watching with us online, and we apologize for any technical difficulties. We're still trying to figure those things out, uh, figure things out. Uh, as I mentioned last week, um, in this season of the year, we are in the basement for a few weeks. In fact, we'll be here for the next five Sundays. And just a reminder, please don't touch any of the furniture upstairs. Uh, if you have children, please uh, be with them when you're upstairs, just to make sure that no hands get on the furniture, which I've found myself wanting to sit on because it is furniture and touch and things like that. It's pretty tempting. So uh, please uh, don't do that. Um, let's see. Uh, also, uh, the, yesterday we had a uh, service project. We did a habitat build, and uh, Ray is going to come up and just share with us a, a little bit about that time. And here, Ray, I'm going to hand you. They can probably hear you, but if you want the mic, I'm going to hand it to you. There you go. Probably goes out over the uh, internet cast better. Well, Rick Forehand took special care to be sure that we uh, had a work day at a house that Habitat was uh, working on. He also seems to have taken special care to be in South Carolina. <laughs> But he has a good excuse. He's a grandparent, and so he was tending to grandparent responsibilities with his grandchildren. But uh, seven folks showed up. Let's see, Melissa and Dick and Peggy Thompson, and Ed and Carrie Vega, and Jonathan Jones. So 
there was a house that needed the interior doors painted and the interior uh, woodwork frames around the doors painted. We were able to do all that, started about eight o'clock, ended right around noon. So there's at least one coat on all of that. So I expect they're gonna have somebody come back behind us and do a second coat. And uh, we also discovered some things that needed to go on the punch list of things. I wish I could have been there. But um, I'm so grateful for all of y'all who went. And those times together, um, yet we are definitely, we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus to love people. Uh, that's one of the reasons we do it. And we are a church that wants to bless and love our community. And in the process, the Lord is kind to bless our fellowship and time together. So we see those times of service as a way to give and to receive to receive blessing and to enjoy one another and get to know one, know one another as we work together. So thank you also. For, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, this Thursday uh, at, at the church offices, we're going to be having a short communion service. As we mentioned last week, one of the changes that we're making is we're going to have uh, a minimum of two uh, communion services during the week, particularly for those who have not been able to attend worship regularly. So uh, we'll have a regular schedule that we'll set up starting in December with the month of Thanksgiving. Or starting in, th uh, in November with Thanksgiving, we just I haven't gotten the schedule lined up. But this Thursday at 12:15 uh, during uh, uh, yeah during the lunch hour, uh, for those particularly for those of you who cannot attend, we'll be having a communion service there. Uh, so please join us for that. Uh, my final announcement, and just to make sure here, I think that's all the announcements. Is there anything else I missed? Great. Uh, the final announcement is today, uh, who, Terry Dykstra, the RUF International Campus Minister at um, the University of Texas, is going to be preaching for us. I've talked to you many times about RUF because we've had many RUF campus ministers come. RUF, the former University Fellowship, is the national college ministry of our denomination. It's, in a sense, the church reaching out to the college campus, and I think of all of our campus ministers as our college minister from our church going to these campuses to love the students from our churches who are going there and to be and to reach out to students who, who don't know Jesus or have just wandered from the faith. RUF also has a branch called RUFI or RUF International that focuses particularly on the international students who come to our campus. One of the amazing things about our country uh, is that we have a wonderful education system that people from all over the world want to come and be a part of. And therefore, uh, yes, we can go to the nations with the gospel, but thankfully a lot of the nations are coming to us and they're coming to our campuses and they're eager to learn and they need friends. And so uh, we're grateful for the ministry of RUFI. When Terry comes up to preach later, he's going to share, uh, well, I hope he is, he's going to share a little bit about himself. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know about that ministry. It's a wonderful ministry, um, and I'm grateful for it. And this week, and for the next two weeks, in our weekly newsletter, we'll have some contact information for Terry. Uh, so that if you want to get on his mailing list or be a part of his prayer team, or you'd like to learn how you might want to support him financially, the information will be there for you to connect with him. He'll also be up here after the service up front if you'd like to speak with him and just meet him and learn more about his family and his ministry. But thank you for being here today, Terry. We're really grateful. So uh, now, as uh, for the passing of the peace, uh, the peace of Christ be with you. Awesome. Take a few minutes to greet each other. We will be back here shortly.
please join with us in singing one more time. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, yeah, as Billy said, my name is Terry Dykstra. It's great to be with you guys this morning. It's such a pretty drive coming out here from Austin. Really love just seeing the hills and all that. So thank you for giving me an excuse to take that drive this morning. Uh, and as Billy said, I'm the campus minister for Reformed University Fellowship International. My wife and I moved to Austin from Atlanta, Georgia in summer of 2017. So this is my fourth year in that role with RUF. And what we want to do, especially in our focus to international students, is to welcome the nations to Austin, to the United States, through hospitality, through fellowship, through community, in Jesus' name, but also to give an opportunity to explore the gospel with them. You know, in some ways, you know, like Billy said, you guys can think of me, if it's easier than like campus minister and all this stuff, you can think of me as... Christ Church Kerrville's pastor to international students at the University of Texas. It's, it's such a great opportunity because, you know, the students are coming here, and obviously we send, we go out, because God calls us to do that as well. But as students come here, think about any of you guys who have been in a new place, in a new situation, there's a lot of unknowns, right? There might be, it might just depend on the situation, but 
You know, some students come and because they don't know anybody, they might be more open to hear the gospel because we're not in their countries where there's a lot more restrictions. You know, they might have more opportunity to actually see and read a Bible and to hear the good news of Jesus. So um, thank you guys so much for your prayers. Like Billy said, I'll make sure to, to include any of you guys who, who want to be a part of that, who want to receive email or snail mail updates going forward, and um, just grateful for this church and for your ministry here. And would appreciate your prayers, you know, in this season, like a lot of people, most of what we've been doing with students this semester has been virtual, um, in part because of the university's guidelines, but also meeting students' comfort levels. Um, but we've experienced God's kindness in that, and so just would, would appreciate your prayers most of all. Our passage this morning comes to us from Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. So if you would, please follow along with me as we read God's word. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he, Jesus, asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they, the disciples, kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest, And Jesus sat down and he called the twelve and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's go now to God in prayer. God in heaven, we thank you so much for your word to us this morning. We thank you for calling us to you, for giving us faith, and for working in us by your spirit. And Lord, I just pray in this time that you would speak through me by that very spirit, that you would open our hearts and open our minds and our souls to receive your word, to receive you and your presence as you were with us this morning, Lord. And God, we ask that you be glorified in all that we do in our worship this morning and as we go from here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was really excited for Billy to ask me to do this passage. It's, it's a great passage. It's easily one of my favorites, but it also follows some of my other favorite passages. You know, previously you got the demonic spirit and that awesome exchange with the father says if you if you can if you will but often um and I would guess that I'm probably not alone in that and then again most recently Jesus predicting his death and his resurrection Things have happened. The disciples have been a part of those. They've seen those. You guys have walked through those in previous weeks. But what are the disciples most concerned about as we come to this passage today? Are they discussing, like, the awesomeness of seeing the transfiguration? Are they talking about, like, man, what does it mean that this kind of demon can only be healed by prayer? Or are they wondering what Jesus meant as verse 32 said that they didn't understand what Jesus meant by his prediction? Is that kind of what has captivated them? Are those the things that they are talking about? Unfortunately, no. They are most concerned, as we see in our passage today, with which of them is the greatest, which one of them was the best and the highest in the pecking order. Can, can relate to that as well, that we spend a lot of our time consciously, but also unconsciously, trying to get to the top of whatever ladder, or the top of whatever pyramid that we value. If any of you guys are sports fans, I'm a big sports fan. You know, we spend every sports season waiting to see which team is going to prove to be the best, and then if we're a fan of that team, us by extension as being the best and being like, hey, like, I cheer for the good guys, right? But also in our homes, on our social media feeds, even among our friends and in our communities, workplaces, all that, 
We, like the disciples, spend time trying to prove that we are enough, trying to prove that we are good enough, and that we are the best as well, because we so badly want to be first. We want to be the best. But Jesus says, if we want to be best in his kingdom, we should be last, least, lowest, and servant of all. And that's why God's kingdom is the last kingdom. In our passage this morning, we see the reminder that we are low. This fall, I've been going through some of our Christian international students for our dinner and Bible discussion through the book of James. And just this past Thursday, as we receive these promises of God, that we would receive his grace, and that he would exalt us. These are tremendous promises that James gives us and that the rest of scripture testifies to if we would humble ourselves and receive the promises of God. Whether we call it insecurity or selfishness, whatever sin issue it is that motivates our desire to be the best and to prove ourselves the best, we, we are often compelled by this quest. Jesus' disciples were no different. Verse 34 says, On the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And there's a few options, of course, right? Was it Peter, the cornerstone of the church? Was it James? Was it John, beloved disciple? Who was it? They had to settle it. They needed to know so that they could have the bragging rights. But when Jesus asked what they were talking about, they kept silent, probably because they were embarrassed, probably because they were ashamed about being captivated by something so trivial. Earlier this week, I finished reading a book called Seculosity by David Zoll. Um, it's secular, but with O-S-I-T-Y at the end. And it was a really great read, very encouraging, but also convicting at times. And basically what Zoll does through that book is outline all the arenas and all the ways that we try to justify ourselves, or as he says, try to prove our enoughness. And these can be through things like our performance in how busy we are, right? Like that's a popular American Western culture, like, hey, how you doing? Oh man, so busy, like don't have time for anything. That's sort of a badge of honor for us, right? It's, it can be parenting methods. And I, I should have said at the beginning, I am married um, to my wife, Mary Rose. We've been married six and a half years. We have a two and a half year old son named Arthur, who's a ton of fun. But parenting methods are another one of these ways that we can justify ourselves and we can prove our enoughness. So if anybody wants to compare toilet training notes or any of that kind of stuff, we can also do that after the service. But it can also be our use of or our abstention, abstaining from technology. It could be through who we vote for or voted for in the recent election. It could even be through our diet, eating or not eating the right food and how strictly we follow those rules. These are just some of the examples that Zal uses in this book to say, our culture is not irreligious. Our culture is very religious. And we look to each of these things to prove our enoughness, to run up the score and to show and prove to others Hey, look how good I am. Look how enough I am. This is how we justify ourselves. And this hits close to home because we want a resume in all areas of life, especially socially, culturally, to be impressive. Like the disciples, we, in those ways, are trying to prove that we are the greatest and trying to settle that dispute 
once and for all. But scripture has another evaluation of us, you know, whereas we, like the disciples would say, hey, which one of us is best? Which one of us is closest to the top? Scripture has another value for us, and it reminds us that we are low. We are born into sin. We are born into nature as enemies of God, and we are even dead in our sins and trespasses from birth. Of course, there's nothing lower than the grave. And so, Jesus needs to teach his disciples a lesson about this. He needs to remind them of this truth. And so, he gathers them around. He assumes a posture of authority as he sits and as he calls them to gather around. And in verse 35, he says, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. In a way, he's almost rephrasing the foretelling of his death and resurrection from the previous passage. In his love for us, Jesus would become last of all and servant for all as he became a curse for us, as he took the punishment that our sin and sinfulness deserves and went into the grave for us to defeat death for us in our place. And as he does this, he shows us how we are loved. As he had told his disciples this very truth previously, but again, they they didn't understand, as verse 32 mentioned, Jesus would sort of re-show them in this passage we're looking at today. So he places a child in front of them and among them, and he embraces this child. In Western culture, in America, especially as somebody in my age and stage of life with a small child and friends the same age who have small children, you know, we love children. My Instagram feed, I'm guilty of this too, so I'm not calling anybody out, but filled with pictures of our kids and what our kids are doing, right? And like, so often, even with students I meet, they ask like, how's Arthur? How's, you know, like, what's he been up to? Baby pictures everywhere. But this is not the culture that Jesus was in, and this was not the case for them then. R.C. Sproul pointed out that, you know, in ancient culture, it was only once children reached an age where they seemed more likely to reach maturity that they had any dignity or any standing culturally, socially at that point. In part, the mortality rate for children five and under was so high that it was just kind of like, well, let's, let's see once he gets to this age or she gets to this age, and then we can you know, treat them as like a real person and a member of society. It was this person with no social or cultural dignity or significance that Jesus takes as a child and places among his disciples and says to them, whoever receives a child in my name receives me. It's a child with, without that standing or that significance, who Jesus appoints to greatness as his ambassador, as his spokesman to the world to say, whoever receives this child receives me. And not only that, but receives him who sent me. He's reminding his disciples, Jesus is, of the gospel. You know, as they're quibbling about which of them is the greatest, they're probably viewing that discussion and even these disciples, but also what they had seen or what they had done or even what they had experienced in the previous passage that you guys are working through. How often do we view ourselves and justify ourselves through that same criteria, through our experiences, through our abilities, through what we As we do that, and even as seculosity reminded me and reminds us that scripture does, we're ultimately looking for salvation in ourselves when we do that. We're ultimately looking for our justification. I'm a good person because I do this because of all the reasons. He places a child among them and bestows this child with greatness, the greatness that the disciples were arguing over, to remind them that we are lavished by God. We are bestowed with so much gifts and grace and honor and dignity because of Jesus. 
And the good news of Jesus is that it is freely given to us. There is no payment to be made. There is no work that needs to be done because the work is finished. It's not based on our status, our ability, our experience, or even our resume. You know, thinking about John 3.16, that's, that's the classic verse that comes up with international students, too. And the good news is that it's not for God so loved Terry because he's a great guy, he's a thriving ministry, and is like a good husband and a good father. No, it's not any of that. It's not that for any of us. It's for God so loved the world that he gave his only and son, that he gave the body and blood of Jesus, which Jesus took on willingly to be a sacrifice for us. That is the criteria by which God says we are enough, that we are good enough because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Like children, like the child Jesus placed among the disciples, we are totally dependent on God, our Father, and we do not have much to offer, if anything. Jesus tells the disciples that if they would receive the child in his name, they would receive Jesus. And the one who sent Jesus as well, God the Father, which we know and do know from Scripture, is what we need most of all, right? It's not to try harder. It's not to do better. It's to receive God and receive the body and blood of Jesus as it is freely given to us. And this should encourage us where we are, of course, that, hey, if we receive those who come in Jesus' name, we are receiving him. That promise holds for us today as well. But that should also encourage us where we are, because as people receive us, if we have faith in Jesus, if we come in his name, that should encourage us to say, like, hey, I don't have to have all the the mission techniques or the experience or the seminary degree to be a witness to Jesus that others would receive him. Of course, I do have those things, but as y'all know, like the Christian life, the Christian ministry is not just for nerds like me who go to seminary and then get ordained and go through all this this stuff. It's great, I enjoy it. I think Billy enjoys it. I can't really tell based on your facial expression through the mask, but (laughs) hopefully, hopefully we're good. But I'm a nerd, I don't know if Billy is, but. If others receive us as we come in Jesus' name, they receive Jesus and God too, which again is what all of us to the ends of the earth need most of all. And this is part of the joy of doing RUF International is that, hey, look, as I meet these students, if they've never heard the gospel in the year to two years that they're with me, they probably are not going to convert. But who knows what God is going to do in these students? You know, who knows what seeds he's going to plant, that they might come to faith at some point, you know, like maybe I'm the first stop, second, whatever, maybe down the road, maybe even as they go back to their country, God is going to meet them by his spirit. God is going to meet them in the body and blood and spirit of Jesus to bring them to faith, that they may be ambassadors in their home countries, in their fields, in whatever they're doing. Friends, that is the good news of Jesus. And Jesus, after all, as he does in this passage, he came to seal us as God's children, to make us his adopted children. And this is the basis on which he loves us. Last summer, just after our son turned to um, my car, badly needed a car wash, And Arthur, our son, loves cars and trucks and wheels and loves to spray the hose as well. So I was like, great, like this this has all the ingredients of a success. And, you know, maybe it'll also be slightly more efficient if I can just like convince him to like scrub the wheels and spray the car. Perfect. But despite his love for all those things, it shouldn't have been a surprise to me. And it probably is not a surprise to any of you guys that bringing my two-year-old son into the car washing process did not make it a more efficient process. (laughs) He was sprayed me more than he sprayed the car, and he's kind of like I was, and and still am to some extent. He doesn't like weird textures or substances on his hands. 
So the sponge was a no-go, like the soap, he just was like, no, I need a napkin and just like wanted to spray me on the face. So <laughs> that's fine. But it was a reminder to me that, you know, okay, like he likes all these things, maybe it's gonna help the car washing process a little bit. It didn't, but that's okay, you know, like it was silly for me to think that, that he was gonna be able to, to help with the process. But the truth is that, you know, while maybe I hoped for some of that, the truth is I just wanted him to help me wash the car because he's my son and because he enjoys some of those things. And it was fun and the car got washed. That is the basis by which God loves us, because we are his children, not because we're good car washers, we're not. But like Billy pointed out with our confession from the prodigal son, the father loves him because he's his son, not because of what he's done. He's done a lot of bad things. He has sinned against his father as he confesses. But the father loves him and welcomes him because he's his son, not because of his abilities, not because of what he can do, not because he's going to work his way back. That is the way that God loves us, and that is part of what Jesus is showing here, that he loves us. God the Father loves us because he has made us his children by the body and blood of Jesus. So it doesn't matter what we do. It's not based on our ability. It's not based on our experiences or our resume. I don't mean to say it doesn't matter. You know, we are called to obedience. I'm not saying obedience doesn't matter. truth, guide us by your spirit. Please, Lord, make us more and more into the image of Jesus, especially as we receive the sacrament in a moment. And please, Lord, dig your love down deep into us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We now come to the Lord's Supper, and this is a meal for sinners. This is a meal for people who recognize their desperate need for a Savior and have looked to Jesus Christ as their only hope. If that's you, if you have come to the point where you have acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, this meal is for you, and we welcome you to it. If that is not where you have come, if you've not come to the place where you see your need for a Savior, and you haven't come to a place where you embrace Jesus as that Savior. And we want to let you know we are grateful that you're here. This is a good place for you to come and to learn more about who Christ is and to ask questions. But we ask that before you come to this meal, you come to him first. Because by partaking of this meal, you are making a public profession of faith. And if you'd like to talk about that, we would love to talk about it with you. Please come and talk to me. I'd love to talk with you about what it means to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And you are even welcome to do that in your seat right where you are. Jesus will receive you as you come to him and acknowledge him as Savior and Lord and, and confess that your desperate need for him. The sermon today, in the sermon today, the, the question was being asked, who is the greatest? Who's the greatest? And this meal every week points us to who the greatest is. It's to one who has given their body and blood, who has given his life so that we might live. And we, we hold it up before our faces. We would never forget that it's Jesus, our great Savior and Lord. Please join with me in these words from Psalm 9, I mean from page 9. Lord, be with you. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up his ha your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
Holy Father, creator of heaven and earth, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give thanks and praise to your glorious name. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Uh, today, when you come forward, we ask that this section would come forward to this table, starting at the front, and that this section would go to the back table, uh, starting in the back. We're going to try this, this, uh, this uh, way this week. So please come forward as you feel that. The body of Christ, broken for you, take and eat. The blood of Christ, shed for you, take and drink. Please stand and join with me in this prayer of thanksgiving. Most gracious God, we give thanks you for what you have given and for what you have promised us here.
Amen. Receive now the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go now in his peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.